All right, everybody, welcome to New Life. Welcome to Summer at New Life. How many people still love Jesus? Come on. Yeah. Oh, look, come on, I'm just going to tell you right now, it's the greatest thing about living is loving Jesus. All right, there's a lot of other things that our country, our world, right, would try to tell you, your friends would try to tell you is the greatest thing, but I'm telling you right now, the greatest thing about living is loving Jesus. So, man, if you're in love with Jesus and you're trying to grow that passionate love for Christ and obedience to him, you're in the right place at the right time. Uh, we're at the last Sunday of our teaching series, Win the Day. It's been super practical. How many of you guys have got something practical out of this series so far? Awesome, awesome. <clears throat> Well, look, if this is your first time here or you haven't been here for a while, right, then you might say to yourself, well, bummer, I'm here on the last Sunday. Well, that's okay because you can also go to MyNewLifeChurch.com. You can click on Watch and then go to our On Demand and you can see all of the sermons from all of this series. You can watch those this next week or over this next month and just kind of feed your heart with God's Word. We've been looking at seven uh, basic practical <clears throat> um, examples and habits that we can apply to our life that will help us be more successful in our spiritual journey. Because if there's one thing in this pastor's heart for you is this, I want you to win spiritually. I want you to be a winner. I, I want you to feel like you're on a winning streak. I don't want you to feel like you know, you're on a losing streak spiritually. I want you to actually be on a winning streak. And so that's why we teach in series and that's why this week is so important. Today, the habit we're going to talk about is simply stated as this, seed the cloud. Seed the cloud. Turn to somebody and tell them, seed the cloud. All right, now maybe you're thinking to yourself, like, what in the world does that mean? Well, from a scientific perspective, all right, it's been proven because we've done it over and over and over again that we know how to seed the cloud with dry ice and you know, silver iodine. And if we seed the cloud with those things, then the water vapors interact with that and it produces rain. And we can make the cloud rain or we can make the cloud snow. Now we can't really, we can't make a cloud out of nothing. So there has to be a cloud there. And that means we just are trying to manipulate that cloud to make it produce something. And, and we can only do this in very minor, small amounts, but they're small enough that the U.S. government during the Vietnam War implemented cloud seeding. From March 1967 through July 1972, Operation Popeye took place. I love the military with these the operation names, because I don't know about you, but when I think of Operation Popeye, I'm thinking about like building some muscles or something like that, eating some spinach, like let, maybe that's it. What were they going to do? Feed people spinach in Operation Popeye? But no, that's not what it was. It was all about seeding the clouds over, over North Vietnam and especially over the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Now look, on Memorial Day weekend, we've got a chair in all of our auditoriums with a Bible and, and a folded flag on it to remember those who have fallen and given their lives, you know, for our freedom and for our nation. And we are super grateful and thankful. And, and many of them gave their lives during the Vietnam War as well. But there was the 54th Weather Reconnaissance Squadron that was on a whole different mission to try to save lives. So they started seeding clouds over the Ho Chi Minh Trail during the monsoon season. And they were actually able, in those few years, they were able to extend the monsoon season on average between 30 and 45 days, which produced a lot of rain on a well-traveled path where the North Viet Cong were trying to come down and to attack and create more war. And the 54 Weather Reconnaissance Squadron was given a mission to create more mud than war. And they did it. And through that, it was even part of helping to save lives. But they weren't the first ones to come up with it. No, it was back in November 13th, 1946. Vincent Schaefer, a scientist on the East Coast, had this theory that if he could put dry ice into a cloud, he might be able to produce rain. So he took a little small single-engine aircraft, and he took off one day over Massachusetts <clears throat> on a cloudy day, and he had people down on the ground watching, and he flew into the cloud. The plane disappears into the cloud, cumulus cloud, and he deposits six pounds of dry ice into the cloud. To the amazement of the people watching on the ground, the cloud started to morph and change and shift and grow. And all of a sudden, it started to produce rain. And on November of 13th of 1946, Vincent Schaefer was the very first one to see the cloud and actually produce rain. Well, the newspaper the next day said, Vincent Schaefer creates rain. Tomorrow, he walks on water. Like, it was that kind of like... 
wow, amazing. We can't believe that he could actually, you know, pull this thing off. It was a bold experiment. Look, as a pilot, I know. Right, you're told, don't fly single-engine airplanes into cumulus clouds because it's a, it's a dangerous place to be. Right? The turbulence is, is massive. The up, up rises and down push of air is incredible, and it can just throw your plane all over the place. And as I was reading about this story, I couldn't help but think to myself as a pilot, right? Man, I guarantee it, what would it have looked like when he flew into that cloud? He's bouncing all over the place, stuff in the cabin that he doesn't have, you know, locked down. He's bouncing all over the place. That, I, that dry ice probably flew itself out the window, right? And he was, he was lucky just to come out on the other side. But it was a risk and reward moment. Risk and reward. If he doesn't take the risk, if he doesn't fly into the cloud, he doesn't get the reward. And that's what seed the cloud principle is all about. It's a sow and reap from a spiritual perspective. It's sowing, it's doing something so that somewhere in the future you might reap something. It's a proactive action, though. It's taking a bold, brave step of faith on purpose so that maybe and potentially one day the outcome will be a godly outcome, something beyond what you could ever dream and or imagine. It's praying bold, brave prayers. It's seeding a spiritual cloud so that one day it rains and it might rain on your life, and sometimes it's going to rain on the next generation. You'll never see it happen in your own lifetime. But it's living for Jesus, right? Where there's maybe no pat on the back, and there's no reward here on this earth. But one day, one day the cloud produces rain, and you stand before Jesus in heaven. And you have a relationship with God that lasts for eternity. Seeding the cloud, we also recognize, can be as simple as smiling at someone that needs a smile. Showing kindness to someone, showing compassion, empathy, right? When we do these things in Jesus' name, we are seeding the cloud into the heart of another person, and we have no idea what that, what that seed will, will, will produce. I know this, when we do it in Jesus' name, it has the ability to produce good things. It may even produce Christ followers in the long run, but the bottom line on why we would even be interested in spiritually seeding the cloud is this. We want to leave a spiritual legacy for our children, our grandchildren. There's no other way to do that, guys, unless we boldly seed the cloud with prayer. Boldly seed the cloud with faithful obedience before Jesus. Then we leave a legacy for other generations to follow. It's a sow and a reap concept. Found in Galatians chapter 6, by the way. Read it with me. It'll be on the screens. Verses 7 through 9. Don't be misled. No, number one, right off the bat, don't be misled. Meaning this, some people don't think this way. Some people believe something that's not true. Don't be misled. Right? You cannot mock the justice of God. All right? Well, then how does the justice of God get played out? You'll always harvest what you plant. Always. Someone say always. You always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. So there is a deposit of wickedness and evil and unrighteousness, and there's, there, the reaping of that is not going to be healthy, right? But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest, a blessing, if we don't give up. It's a principle. It's a promise. God's going to fulfill his promise. What you sow, you will reap. Either the consequences of or the blessing of. So let me just ask you a simple question. If you plant carrot seeds, what will you get? If you answered carrots, you're right. All right? If you answered something else, you're wrong. Yeah, let's do another one just to make sure that everybody can be on the same winning page. All right? Let me make it as simple as I can. If you plant pumpkin seeds, what do you get? Squashes. Whoever says squashes, leave the room right now. You get a pumpkin, all right? You get a pumpkin, all right? That's what I'm talking about. You're a Halloween-style pumpkin. That's the kind of pumpkin I was talking about, all right? Now, look, if you plant nothing, what will you get? Nothing. You don't get nothing. What is it that you really get if you don't plant anything? You get weeds. You get weeds. This, the principle of what I just told you, and it was funny, I get it, but you, you can't break the principle or the law of sow and reap. It's a God law. It's a God principle, Right? It either breaks you or it makes you. You're either teamed up with God 
or you're reaping the consequences of not being teamed up with God. And let me just talk for a second about the reaping part because that's the part we really want. We want to sow as little and reap as much as we can because that's who we are as human beings. Verse 9 in that passage of Galatians chapter 6 told us that it's God who determines when the blessing comes. At just the right time, you will reap a harvest. It's always God's timing. So look, you might be praying about something right now and not seeing the answer to it. Don't give up. God's timing. Right? You might be believing for something and it's not happening. You might be walking through a difficult season right now asking God to rescue you from it and it's not happening. Don't give up. It's God's timing. Our job is to do one simple thing. Be faithful with the small things like flip the script, kiss the wave, eat the frog, fly the kite, Cut the rope. Wind the clock. Anybody here for those weeks? That's what God asks us to be faithful with. And if, again, if you weren't here, my new life church. But he also asks us to be faithful and remain faithful in seeding the clouds with brave and bold prayer. So if you want to win the day, church, if you want to win the day, it's, you don't win the day by wishing upon a star. All right? It's not a fairy tale or a fairy land that you live in. You, you win the day by seeding the clouds with bold prayer. You win the day by just remaining faithful to Jesus one day at a time. And the prophet, the prophet Elijah, he actually is the one who gave us this principle. Way back before anyone ever physically seeded clouds, he was spiritually seeding clouds. In 1 Kings chapter 18, I want you to take your Bible, turn to 1 Kings chapter 18, go to verse 41, join me there. And um, if you do that, let me give you the backstory while you're finding it. The backstory is this. It hasn't rained for three and a half years in Israel. Okay, the people are desperate. Uh, the Bible tells us that they're out and they're searching for water in places they don't normally search for water. They're, they're, they're climbing down into caves. They're trying to find pools of water. They're trying to find springs of water that maybe they knew nothing of. The people are desperate. The crops haven't grown. The fields are barren. The ground is hard as concrete. And the people are hungry. It's a bad time. And at that very moment, here's, here's the context, and here's where we find 1 Kings 18, 41. It says, Then Elijah said to Ahab, Go get something to eat and drink, for I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. Notice that. What, did he, what, what happened for Elijah? What did he hear? He heard a mighty rainstorm. He didn't see one. He heard one. Hang on to that. For Ahab... So Ahab, he went to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel, and he bowed down to the ground, and he prayed, he prayed, with his face between his knees. He started seeding the cloud. Then he said to the servant, go and look out toward the sea. And the servant went, and he looked, and he returned, and he said, look, I don't see anything. Seven times Elijah prayed, and he told him to go and look. And finally, the seventh time, his servant told him, I saw a little cloud about the size of a man's hand rising from the sea. Then Elijah shouted, hurry to Ahab and tell him, climb, climb into your chariot and go back home. If you don't hurry, the rain will stop you. And soon the sky was black with clouds, right? A heavy wind which makes noise and thunder and brought a, brought a terrific rainstorm. And Ahab left quickly for Jezreel. Watch what happens here though. Then the Lord gave special strength to Elijah. He tucked his cloak into his belt and he ran ahead of Ahab's chariots all the way to the entrance of Jezreel. Now look, before we talk about, you know, how you seed the cloud, right, in your life, can we just stop for a moment and take, take notice of the second miracle that's taking place here? A man tucks his cloak, right, whatever that actually means, tucks it up and says, I'm just going to take off running because I don't have a horse. I don't have chariots. And he actually gives, is given the strength by God to outrun a chariot pulled by a horse, that's a pretty cool miracle, right? I don't know about you, but I would love to. Like if God was say, saying to me, Jeff, look, I didn't make your body for running, but if I did make your body for running, okay, because look, some bodies are made for it. Other bodies are made to run into things. That's my body, okay? My body runs into things and through things. I don't run long distances, all right? My body tells me this. I don't have to go figure it out or find out, all right? I just know. I'm smart that way. But if God were able to say, Jeff, I'm going to give you the ability to outrun a horse. And by the way, the distance between Mount Carmel and Jezreel is somewhere between 20 and 30 miles. Depending on what route you take. How many of you guys are taking the 20 miles if you've got to run? 
right? But, but he runs this 20 or 30 miles with this supernatural strength. If God were to tell me to do that, I would grow my hair out just to feel the wind in my hair. It would be like a convertible car driving down, you know, the interstate on the Pacific coast. I mean, I would just, I would eat it up. It would be awesome. But my body's not made for that. However, our campus pastor, our online campus pastor, Pastor Robert Gans, now he's made for running and marathon running. In fact, he's the defending champion of a marathon, that, a half marathon that takes place in Papillion. And just a couple of weeks ago, he went and defended his championship and became number one again. Our very own. Our very own. But he weighs like 12 pounds. And his bones are made of air. He's like a he's like a modern human day bird. I mean, he just runs. He's crazy. But Robert, I got I got a word from you. It might be a prophetic word since we're talking about that, or it could just be like my pizza ate last night. But it, maybe if you wore a cloak, there's something about a cloak that God mentions there that allowed him to run faster. Try that in your next marathon, will you? Figure out what a cloak is and wear it and tuck it and see if you can run faster. So how how do you seed the cloud? You seed the cloud with a prophetic voice, a prophetic voice. Now, when I say the word prophetic, um, some of you are thinking to yourself, A, I'm not qualified. That sounds really like a high-level position to be prophetic. Um, And B, many of you are thinking about prophecy, and you're thinking about, like, speaking about, like, the end times and things to come. And I I just want you to know, like, in the slice of the word prophetic, that's a very small amount. The, the, uh, the idea of, of the prophetic is just simply this, speaking God's heart for this very moment. That's it. Speaking God's heart for this very moment. Many times it doesn't even start with, thus saith the Lord, right? Did you realize that right now you're in a prophetic moment? That we sought the Lord, we prayed, we, we searched his word, we wrote the sermon, but it wasn't, it wasn't just our idea, it was God's ordained idea for us today at this very moment right and so right now my my whole like journey right now is to figure out God how do I let your spirit speak through me and not just Jeff Baker speak because if your spirit speaks through me we live in a prophetic moment right now if Jeff Baker just speaks right now then we live in a pathetic moment and we strive to be in a prophetic moments. We want to be in those life-giving moments where we're speaking things to you that are coming from God's heart for you at this very moment. And I'm just going to say this to you. Many of you walk in more prophetic moments than you ever imagined or dreamed. You didn't even know it was happening, but God was using your voice. You didn't even know it was happening, but God was using your actions. That time when you encouraged someone, it wasn't just you. It was God speaking through you. That time when you prayed for someone, and you were praying for them, and man, you were moved in that moment, God was speaking through you. That time when you were generous, and you went out of your way to bless someone, that wasn't just your idea, that was God's idea, and you were acting in the prophetic, being the hands and the feet of Jesus in that very moment to some other person. Just think what would happen if you were more intentional about wanting to hear God's voice. Think what would happen if you were actually taking time to go, Jesus, I want to hear your voice, because I want to kind of, I want to be the voice of Jesus for this very moment to this person in this moment to pray for them while I'm at work while I'm at school while I'm at home with my spouse just think what would happen if we were more intentional I'll tell you what would happen we would seed the clouds with more prophetic bold brave prayers we would seed the cloud with more obedient living before Jesus and that's exactly what Elijah did there was something that he heard look in verse 41 it says that then Elijah said to Ahab Go get something to eat and drink. Why? I hear something. I hear a rainstorm coming. It hasn't rained for three and a half years, guys. But he hears something. He doesn't see it. If you see something, it's easy to believe in it. But when you don't see it and you can't touch it and all you do is hear it, that becomes a weird moment. When you tell someone, hey, this is what, can I just pray for you? I really sense that God God wants to do something in your life right now. That becomes one of those odd moments when you just hear something. What's he hearing? He's not hearing the wind. He's not hearing thunder. The sea isn't speaking to him. It's the Holy Spirit speaking to him. The Holy Spirit speaking to him, and he's telling him, it's getting ready to rain. It's getting ready to rain. I hear. You realize that your ear only hears what you train your ear to hear. 
And all of us have trained our ears to hear certain things. A mom trains her ears to hear the voice of her child. If, if you guys have ever been in a large group, and then all of a sudden, you know, as a kid, you heard the voice of your dad, Jeffrey, because that's, that's normally, because I was in trouble, so his full name, Jeffrey, man, I, I picked that voice out, right? Even a child starts to identify and hear the voice of a father and a mother and vice versa. Well, you have to train your ear because your ear will only hear what you train your ear to hear. There was a, um, um, a, a what an opera singer about, I don't know, 50, 60 years ago who started losing his ability to actually sing high notes. And he thought maybe it was in his voice that he couldn't sing those high notes. So he went to an ear, nose, and throat doctor in France, and this French doctor, Tomatis, he discovered that the opera singer was actually producing a volume at 140 decibels, the sound of a fighter jet taking off, and that the opera singer was actually damaging his own ears, and at certain frequencies, he, he just knocked out those frequencies, damaging his ears so much by his own voice. Can you imagine that? You think you're loud sometimes, or your kids are loud? Nothing like an opera singer right? Damaging their own ears. And here's the problem. Like, you can only produce volume and vocally and on pitch and on tone what your ears can hear. That's all you can produce. So he wasn't able to hit the note. He wasn't able to maintain the note. He wasn't able to stay on tune because he had damaged his own ears. Can I say this? Our biggest problem is this, that we've deafened our own ears to the whisper of the Holy Spirit. One of the reasons why we don't walk confidently in the prophetic voice of the Lord in our personal lives is we've damaged our own ear to hear his whisper. Here's how we've done it, the pace of our life. Did you realize the pace of your life has a volume to it? It demands your mind to constantly be racing and for your ears to hear, right? Like in a, in a mental kind of a sense, what it is that's being generated and the noise around you and the searching and the producing and the, the product and, you know, the, the reports and on and on and on. And there's just so much noise. Our lives are so fast. It's so much. We're like a fighter jet damaging our own ears to hear God's voice. Then you add on top of that the media, the news and the advertisements and the social media and the podcasts and the music. And it's a nonstop barrage of entertainment and activities that we can fill our ears with that are deafening, deafening the voice of God. Can I just ask you this question? When was the last time that you were awake? That's key. When was the last time you were awake in a quiet place on purpose? Because I was in a quiet place on purpose last night, but it was called sleep. When was the last time you were awake in a quiet place on purpose? Because you and me, we're not going to retrain our ear to hear the voice of God unless we're willing to go to that quiet place while I'm awake on purpose. But let's take it one step further. Let's say you did find that place. The next thing you're going to find is this. Your self-talk is going to be barraging you against hearing the whisper of the Holy Spirit. Because as soon as you get to a quiet place, this thing doesn't turn off. It takes a long time for this to turn off. So what's happening up there? Well, studies have shown that 80% of your thoughts are negative thoughts. So when you get to that quiet place and you're trying to hear the whisper of the Holy Spirit, you got to battle through 80% of you telling yourself why you shouldn't be here, why you don't belong here, why you're not qualified to be here. All of the failures of your life, all of the mistakes, and all of the, all of the junk of your past, and that's what's filtering through your mind. And then add on top of that when you're in that quiet place, the lie of the enemy. You're not good enough. Who do you think you are to try to hear God's voice? God doesn't have time for you. God's got a universe to run. You got all of that that's going on. So if we're going to start seeding the clouds with the prophetic voice of God, it means we have to hear his voice. What has to happen first? We have to let God change the way we think. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says this. Let God transform you into a new person by what? Say it with me. By changing the way you think. Right? Watch what happens. Then you will learn to know God's will for you. Then you will start to hear the prophetic voice of God. Then you will start to hear the whisper of God. When? When God is invited. When God's allowed. When you 
press through all the noise and you get into that quiet place and you let God start transforming the way you think, the way you see yourself, the way you love yourself, the way you see this world, the way you trust in God, right? The way you trust in him for all your resources, your relationships, your, your finances, your occupation, for your family. The way when you get to that quiet place and God starts to transform the way you think, guess what happens? The clarity of God's voice just keeps going up and up and up, which what? What does it say about God's voice? It is good and pleasing and perfect. This is what I want for you, but I can't give it to you. The only way you can, the only way you can find this is by pressing through the noise, getting along with God and letting God transform the way you think. So here's the word for many of you that you need to hear today. If Elijah could hear God's whisper, so can you. So how do you do it? Well, if you want to hear the whisper of God, then you're going to have to let the volume of God's voice get turned up in your life. How does the volume of God's voice get turned up in your life over the noise of this world? you got to spend more time in the Bible. See, because when you open the Bible, God opens his mouth. You want to hear God's voice? Open the Bible. A Barna report recently did a survey on a bunch of Christians, and they discovered that the people that are hearing God's voice most clearly are people that are in God's word four times or more in a week. Four times or more. Listen, watch this. I just want you to know something. Three times or less had like this kind of a jump. Four times or more had this kind of a jump. It was astronomical. It was huge. Why? Because people started opening up God's word and God started opening up his mouth. And then what they start, what could they do? What do people do that start hearing God's voice more clearly? They start seeding the clouds with more prophetic prayers. They start seeding the clouds and, and impacting. They start sowing, you know, with the voice of God versus just the voice of self. And I'm telling you, what you sow, you will reap. Here's the other thing. How do you seed the clouds? You seed the clouds with patient persistence. Patient persistence. Many times, I just believe that you and me, we, we give up or we lose focus way too early. We lose it many times right before God's getting ready to do something amazing in our life. Our commitment slacks or our faith takes a nosedive. We start making poor choices and poor decisions. It's like we get, we get ADD in our spiritual pursuit after God. And I know, I know this about modern day Christianity, that patience and persistence are like our kryptonite. They're like, our, they're like the kryptonite to, like Superman made him what? Weak? Modern day Christianity is weak because we don't, we don't know what it means to be patient and wait on God. We're the microwave generation. We don't know what it means to be patient. We don't know what it means to be persistent. I'm going to tell you right now, I don't know what kind of legacy you're trying to leave, but I want to leave a greater spiritual legacy than was ever handed to me for my children and for my own grandchildren. And I'm going to tell you right now, it's not going to come by amazing speaking. It's going to come by being persistent and being you know, patient in pursuing God in the quiet time of my life through prayer and seeking God through his word and trying to be a man who lives out the purpose and the meaning of Christness in, in this world. That's what it's going to be. It's going to be, a, it's going to be a guy who allows God's word and God's spirit to keep developing the fruit of the spirit in my life. I'm nowhere near where I want to be. Nowhere near. I'm down here. God wants me to be up here, guys. I, I'm trying to grow in that direction. That's the kind of, that's spiritual legacy. Spiritual legacy has nothing to do with how many dollars you leave your kids. Spiritual legacy has everything to do with the spiritual mantra that you lived and that you, you maintained. And that man or that woman of faithfulness and bold pursuit after God. That's legacy. That's what you want to leave. So we can't back down. We have to keep seeding the clouds patiently with persistence. Even though you don't see anything. Even though you don't hear anything, we got to keep digging the well, right, of God's word in our life so we're standing in a deep well that we have something to pray out of. We have something to give out of. Faithful, patient, persistence. This is what you see in Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 18, in verse 42. It says, Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel. He bowed low to the ground, and he prayed with his face between his knees. Then he said to the servant, go and look out toward the sea. And the servant went, and he looked. Then returned to Elijah, and he said, I don't see anything. Seven times Elijah told him to go and look. Finally, the seventh time, 
his servant told him, I saw a little cloud about the size of a man's hand rising from the sea. Remember, it hadn't rained for three and a half years. But Elijah was praying. Why? Why was he praying, guys? Why didn't he give up after the first prayer? Because my first point, he had heard the prophetic whisper of God. Elijah, it's going to rain. So he prays. He prays what he heard God speak into his heart. And as he's praying this, he keeps praying, and he doesn't see anything, and he doesn't give up. Hey, go check again. It's the fourth time. Can you imagine what the servant's like? Seriously, man? Like, you want me to go walk over there and look again? It's been three times. There's been nothing. I'm telling you, there's not going to be anything. Nope, told him. Elijah, there's nothing. I'm going to pray some more. Okay, I'm going to sit on the rock. I'm going to be on Facebook. You let me know. Right? And it goes, goes all the way through this. I mean, what if Elijah would have given up on the sixth prayer? What? On a side note, there's a lot of sevens in the Bible. And then a lot of people believe that the, that the number seven is a number that's significant, that it means, per, it means like perfection or completion. And, they, and we get that because it's on the seventh day that God rested. And, and you see this, like the, the number seven becomes an instrumental number in God's word. And so let me take you through a couple of sevens really quick, all right? The Israelites, they, to take over a, a city that had incredible walls, Jericho, they, they marched around that thing seven, seven days. And on the seventh day, they marched around it seven times, all right? And the walls fell. Nahum, which you, I get it, like you may not know who this guy is, but in 2 Kings chapter 4, um, he, he's got a sickness, and he's told to go like, dip himself in the Jordan River seven times for healing. He does it, and he's healed. Elijah, he goes and he prays, and how many times does he have to pray? Seven times. And on the seventh time, a cloud the size of a man's hand. How do you even see a cloud the size of a man's hand? See, but it's there. This is like the smallest thing that starts to happen. Let me ask you the hypothetical question. What if uh, the Israelites stop marching around the walls of Jericho on the seventh day on the sixth time? The walls don't fall. What happens if Nahum stops dipping himself in the river for the healing that he was in desperate need of six times? He doesn't get healed. What happens if Elijah stops praying on the sixth time? Rain never comes. They would have missed out on the powerful miracle that God had for their life. So I want you to remember today, it's, it's patient, persistent. It's the consistency that wins in the end. Consistency wins over like intensity seven days out of the week. Consistency. It's being faithful with the little thing. Being faithful with the small thing. So how in the world... Do you live out this patient persistence and bust through all the noise that's in this world? How do, we, how do we seed the cloud with patient persistence? I think Jesus gives us the answer in Matthew 7, 7. He says this, keep on asking and you'll receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you'll find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. You got to seed the clouds with bold, brave prayers by asking, seeking, and knocking. When you don't see your prayer being answered, you keep asking, you keep seeking, you keep knocking. When you're living through a hellish moment and you're asking God for deliverance and it doesn't seem like it's coming, you keep seeking, you keep asking, you keep knocking. When life says it's most difficult or you're standing on top of the mountaintop of life, keep asking, seeking, and knocking. I mean, I just got I wrote this into my notes because I felt so strongly about this when I wrote these um, on Friday morning. But I don't know if it was for the first service or it's for this service or if it's online or if it's somebody that's going to watch 10 years from now. I just know this is for somebody or a group of people. That this is the word. It's not too, it's, it's not, it, it don't, don't quit, right? It's too early to quit and it's too early to give up. It's too early. It's too early. Some of you are ready to give up. Some of you are ready to walk away. Some of you are ready to throw in the towel. It's too early to give up. It's too early to quit. It's too early to throw in the towel. Like, it's time to pray one more time. It's time to keep praying and seeking the Lord. That if God puts something on your heart, don't quit. Don't walk away from it. Keep seeking God. Keep pressing into God. Keep praying bold prayers. God's listening. And I'm telling you, one day, in the right time, which only God knows, you will reap what you sow. So wrapping up this message, every single one of us are beneficiaries of those who seeded the clouds in generations before us. The auditorium that you're sitting in listening to this message right now, it was seated, right, with those who went before us. 
It could have been, it could have been decades ago. It could have been years ago. Right? But our faith, my faith, I'm so thankful for my faith, but I know that my faith is built on my parents, who's built on my grandparents, and built on my great-grandparents. I don't even know what was before that. Somewhere back in the Baker line, somebody made bold steps of faith. They seeded the clouds, and it's still being, it's still being felt to this day with my children and prayerfully my grandchildren. But we're all beneficiaries. But now, guys, it's our turn. It's not just about what they did. It's about what you're going to do. I want to leave, and I want you to leave the greatest spiritual legacy possible. So would you just write down these three things? This is what I want you to do for the next six days. The next six days, I want you to do an experiment with me. Six days. I want you to wake up tomorrow morning. I know it's a holiday. So wake up at 10 or whatever morning means to you. Noon, I don't care. Right, wake up tomorrow morning and seed the clouds in God's word. First and foremost, start in God's word. Number two, seed the cloud in prayer tomorrow for your children, for your marriage, for your grandchildren, for your future spouse, your future family, your church, and even your pastors. Seed the cloud in prayer, for things that matter to you on this earth, that are most important on this earth. And lastly, I want you to seed the cloud tomorrow by choosing to live boldly for Jesus. It's a choice. Every day you wake up, every minute, every moment, it's a choice. Seed the cloud by choosing to live boldly for Jesus. And then I want you to do this. On Tuesday, I want you to wake up and do it again. And then I want you to take that winning streak, and I want you to wake up on Wednesday and do it again. And I want you to add to that winning streak and make it Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And then I want you to show back up here. And I want us to do an experiment this week that if we are to seed the clouds, right, in God's word, in prayer, and in righteous living, I just want you to see how it changes you that next Sunday you're going you're gonna to be a different person. You're going to sow all week long. You're going to reap something. Next Sunday, something is going to happen in your life. There's going to be, when we go into worship time, there's going to be a greater passion. We go into worship, there's going to be something you're going to anticipate. You're going to actually be coming to church with this expectation in your heart, like, I wonder what God's going to do today. I wonder what God's going to say to me today. Like, that's going to be what's going to stir inside of your heart. It's not going to be this, like, hey, it's Sunday again. Which service are we going to go to? It's going to be like, hey, it's Sunday again. Let's get, there, let's get to whatever service we're going to, and let's come with expecting hearts that God's going to speak to us. Because, man, God's been speaking to me during the week. I can't wait to hear what God's got to say this Sunday. So let's all go on an experiment together. Because what you sow, you reap. And if you want to win the day, we've got to seed the clouds. Amen? Amen? Why don't you stand with me? Father, we thank you for today. We thank you we live in a part of the world that seasons change, but you never change. We're thankful, God, that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever, that your promises are true. The Lord, your promises you fulfill. And the Lord, you have a promise set before us today that if we sow righteousness, we reap it. If we sow with Christ-centeredness, we reap it. If we sow out of obedience to you, we reap it. And Lord, I want for this entire congregation this week to see the clouds in your word. And as they open your word, would you open your mouth for them? And speak to them. Lord, may we seed the clouds by praying, not just for ourselves, but for our futures. And and pray prophetically for our families and our marriages and our businesses. Right? Praying, God. And may we seed the clouds by choosing to live righteous in your eyes. And Lord, if and when we fail, would you just help us, God, just to get right back up and brush off that self-talk? Brush off that, the enemy's talk and just get back up and just keep living the rest of the week for you. And Lord, would you stir an expectation in our hearts that when we show back up here again next Sunday, we'd be expecting you to do the miraculous in our lives. As we sow, may we reap. In Jesus' name, amen.